Hey, Adams, how goes, how goes? Lekker, dankie, daar is die foto by my nie. Hey, Martien. Ek ben van lang daar weg, ons kan die foto hee die. Thank you, Mr. Martien. Ja, I'm gonna mute him. We're gonna go live now, people. Okay, ek gaan mute. Okay, that one I must probably... That's fine, that's fine. Stack to Aaron, stack to Marian. <laughs> if it doesn't work, then we can. Yeah. We're going to go. Let's do it as the final. Okay. We'll try it. Okay. okay. Just tell me when it's calm down. Yes, Clinton, I can your presentation see. Okay, great. Okay, you got on. Here we go. Did I click broadcast here? Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Clinton Windvogel. I am the Learning Officer for Cape Nature. And welcome to Cape Nature presents Learning to Hashtag Love Nature, Hashtag Heritage Day. Welcome once again. And I hope that you will enjoy this webinar. I am certainly going to join it. Um, but let's get into what is Heritage Day all about. Um, Heritage Day was first introduced in South Africa on the 24th of September, 1995. And the main purpose of that, of, of Heritage Day was to celebrate our unique cultures, customs, and beliefs. And today, and more specifically in this webinar, we will be celebrating and as the invite is stating, nature has a story to tell. So we will hear about the unique um, animals and plants of the specific of the Western Cape and nature definitely has a story to tell. Uh, and really, I hope that you will enjoy it. Also keep in mind that um, at the end of this uh, or close to the end of, of our webinar today, we will be handing out um, a spot prize, so stay tuned because you might be the lucky winner of that fabulous prize. But let me also um, state to you the rules of conduct um, and actually first start off by saying what is Cape Nature doing and what is Cape Nature all about? So Cape Nature is a government organization that protects natural occurring plants and animals within the Western Cape. And <clears throat> specifically today as the audience, you will be, um, be introduced into all the plants and animals that we protect. And by doing so, we would like to change and influence your behavior. Just some rules of conduct or housekeeping rules. And that is to, you can say hi in the text box. You can raise your questions in the Q&A box. And I would like to request only the presenters, myself, uh, to have the speakers on and their videos. And if you have any unanswered questions or additional questions, you can also direct them to learning at capenature.co.za. But let me start with the ball, the first presenter, and I would like to also welcome our presenters. Our first presenter will be uh, Mr. Edward Adunas, and he is going to talk. He is the doctor that's on call about nature. So I'm going to hand over to Edward Adonis. Edward, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, this is Edward Adonis. Um, I'm a stakeholder engagement officer, and uh, I'm going to talk about plants and uh, Hopefully, there's a lot of people that, that um, love plants like I do. 
So the, I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay. Okay. Um, so yes, as I said, I'm going to talk about medicinal plants, and uh, it's uh, it's I really love uh, to understand and to know how plants work, and then also um, what they can can what they provide um, us. But to start off, what is natural heritage? And according to UNESCO, natural features, geological and physiographical um, formations, scientific conservation or natural beauty, private and publicly protected natural areas, zoos, aquaria, and botanical gardens, natural habitats, uh, marine ecosystems, um, sanctuaries, reservoirs. So that is basically your natural heritage. Now, our uh, uh, Cape Nature strategic uh, plan includes the management of our rich natural heritage for the joy and benefit of all people. And, um, and this is why it's so important to us to protect our natural heritage. Now, the Cape Floristic Kingdom um, is one of our natural heritage assets. And specifically, you know, we all understand uh, it's fine goes. Now to talk about Feinbos, it's very interesting. And um, to start off, um, Feinbos, almost 70% of its species are endemic, uh, which means it is found nowhere else on earth. Um, the core Cape sub-region comprises less than 0.05% of the earth's land surface, um, yet harbors 3% or 4% of the world's um, species. And also, um, it's, it's a small, very small area. And there's about 9,300 species just on this small area. Just to give you an idea how small it really is, but very, very unique and very important. Um, if you look at this map, for instance, um, uh, we have what we call, let me start with the Australian, um, because it's basically just uh, the, the it just covers the Australian um, continent. That's the, the one uh, floristic kingdom that, we've, that we have in the world. And if you take the boreal um, kingdom, that will include your North America, um, Europe, Asia. And uh, if you take new tropical, um, that's your um, South America. And then the paleotropical is Africa and then India, as you can see on the map. And then the last one is the Patagonian one um, or the Antarctic uh, um, 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 floristic kingdom. But ours, um, the Cape floristic kingdom is the smallest and you can see how small it is. And that is why it's so important for us as Cape Nature to, to protect us. You only find it at the southern tip of Africa um, and it's only in one province in South Africa itself. And that is why Feinbos is so special. Now, <clears throat> Feinbos and its medicinal plants. Now, our indigenous people lived off the land, dependent on plants and animals. Um, and, uh, you know, our, our uh, natural people, like the koi, for instance, um, we specifically, as there's an interesting tribe there in Mamariwe, we are working and we're working very closely with them. Um, some of our parents, for instance, but definitely our grandparents and great grandparents and their parents, for instance, they lived off uh, of the plants and animals in the field. Now, um, just looking at the picture that I'm showing you here, the one at the bottom left, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a salvia species. And interesting about that is, you know, you can pick up the thing that looks like a horn and if you suck it, it has, has all the nectar in it. It's very sweet. Uh, we as kids um, uh, call it the vainbos because we, we thought it would make us drunk. <laughs> but of course it didn't. It was just nectar. But uh, um, that's the salvia or the brain sali. And then the one next to that, it's the bito or the buta besi bos, for instance. Um, it's got the yellow flower. <clears throat> and interesting about the seeds, né? you get the green color. 
and then it becomes white and then a deep red like that picture there and it's so sweet we as kids you know we, we, we really enjoyed it and basically i think about two weeks ago i went into the field and found a few berries and again it was just great the the english word for butter bear besi is called brother berry and it's because of all the berries that are close together so that is just an interesting fact there now the following plants are all indigenous and not in endangered um and i'm just going to go through them and you're most welcome to visit the, the sandby um, plants um, africa.com site um and uh, and you will will see there's quite interesting plants on the sand beside um now to start with this one it's called the kwehut or everlasting and it was used for coughs and colds and infections and interesting is that the rastafarians use it to treat asthma chest problems and high blood pressure and the koi used it for leaves the leaves and flowers as bedding Africa. Uh, another interesting one is the pig's ear or dog's ear or fark oor. Um, and interesting about this plant is that um, the leaves uh, was used to treat corns, boils, warts, and then fever blisters as well. Um, and if you warm the leaf, the juice, you can pour it into your ear for, for, for ear aches. And um, the Southern Sutu also used the dried leaves as a protective charm for orphaned uh, children. Um, but there's another interesting story here. It's that uh, some farmers actually say that if sheep eat this, they get crimpsy. Now, I'm, I, I can't uh, say th that I've seen it, but uh, that's what according to the, the farmers. But I had people in the field one time, and this one guy took the leaf and he just started eating it and he said, wow, yo, it still tastes great. So yeah, um, yeah. So basically you can eat it as a snack as well. Then another interesting plant, it's the wild rosemary of Kapok bush. The, the, the birds love this bush né? because they use the, the seeds, which is the white cotton, and they put it in there to line their nests. Um, also, interesting if you need conditioner you put it in the water for about 15 minutes and then you use that water to condition your hair or if you have problems with your feet you know you have always tired feet you can also put it in the water and just let the, let all the tiredness go out through your through your feet um, into the water uh, interesting is van Wyk, um, et al 2008 says that it, that it relieves chest ailments in children Another interesting plant, the cancer boost or Sutherlandia frutescens, um, uh, that was used to cure for cancer and, and immune booster. Uh, treatment for HIV or AIDS research is, of course, still ongoing. But interesting, this one, my mother actually um, drank it, and, um, and that basically, you know, it, it, it picked her up. It was like a tonic for her, so she enjoyed drinking the, the cancer boost. Um, now the Wilder Us, I think most of the people that are interested in plants, they, they know this one. Uh, mostly widely used in South Africa. It's a tonic herb, antiseptic and antidepressant. Uh, um, you can make a tea of it. You can uh, use it as a body wash, colds, head, headaches, fevers and sore throats. Um, another interesting thing here, you can insert a rolled piece of fresh leaf into your nostril to clear the blocked nasal passages. And um, I actually um, learned a lot of my plant um, from David Bester, who died a few years back. And, um, and he actually put the thing right into a nose. And I was so surprised, but it worked. It worked very well for him. And there's more other things that you can also use the Wilder Owls for. Then the last plant. It's the sour fig or pear de fay or elan's fay. The top one, the yellow one, is the pear de fay, and the bottom is the elan's fay. The elan's fay, the fruit is very tasty. You uh, really, it's nice. 
um, it, is, it is also sweet. Um, you can use it for sore throat. Uh, basically, you take the, the leaves and you can crush it. You can drink the juice or you can maybe you can eat it and get for sore throat. And thrust, you know, sores in a baby's mouth. Um, people are still using it today. You crush the leaf and then use that water or the juice just to wash the baby's mouth with it for three days and, and, it, and it will heal the mouth. And then also as a lip ice, you can use it as a lip ice or sunscreen lotion. Even if you have sunburn, you can also apply it onto the burn, uh, burned area. And then also the, uh, the blue bottles, um, those are, um, I'm not sure about that one, but yes, Santen Lawson, um, definitely, because I used it by Xiao. Now, to end off um, Cape Nature, um, we are a regulatory authority in Western Cape for the issuing of permits for the harvesting of fauna and flora. And um, if you want to uh, remove any plants um, in terms of legislation, no person shall without a permit pick any endangered or protected flora from any property. Um, and if you want to know whether a plant is edible or not, um, they do call it the, 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 uh, um, um, uh, the taste, uh, I can't get to the word, but you take a small piece uh, of, of the plant, if it's bitter or it burns your, your, your mouth or your lips, don't eat it, just spit it out. Um, otherwise, if, it's, if, it's, if you don't taste anything, you just stay, uh, wait for about half an hour, and then you take another small piece and wait for another half an hour, and then um, it's apparently fine to eat. Um, but we can't say people go out and taste the plants and eat as you like. No, with any plant you want to eat, with any plant you want to taste, you have to consult a doctor before using any plant for medicinal purposes. And um, go out there, um, uh, specifically visit the sandy um, um, site and then and, and look, there's quite a lot of interesting plants there and they do give a lot of detail around um, the uses, whether it's endangered or not. Um, and, and also um, the ecology about it, the, the distribution and all the plants that I've mentioned, uh, you basically can find it mostly in Southern Africa, um, in South Africa, sorry. And then just the one other thing is that the, 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 the fig, um, it's interesting that during a fire, your tortoises will, for instance, go and hide in your, in your sour fig for protection. So, yeah, and that is basically my story. Um, if you have any questions, we can then uh, take it uh, from there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Edward. That was very, very interesting. Um, and I see the, there are a number of questions that's coming up. Um, so let me start with uh, a few questions. Um, I have a few of my own, but let's, the audience is of importance here. And um, yeah, the first question that, that is here is from um, a person, um, just, yeah, Mignon Berger. Uh, what is in the cancer bush that cures cancer? Edward? Yeah, sorry, I, that I can't definitely not answer because um, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's something that doctors and your researchers need to have a look at, um, you know, get the plant, see what, what chemicals is in the plant. So um, that that I can't answer, but uh, we can, if you want to send an email, then we can see, we, we can put you in contact with, to answer your question. Thank you. The next question is, what happens if you eat the, I think it's the Wilder Owls, Edward? Yeah, I can't say what, what will happen. Uh, you will definitely not taste good, that I can promise you. Um, but yeah, like yeah. I said, like I said um, anything you want to eat, you first need to consult a doctor to make sure that it is safe. 
uh, or some uh, expert that works on plants specifically, um, then you can, can go ahead. But for now, uh, rather don't take anything. Okay. Um, how long do you keep the wilder owls in your nostril, Edward? <clears throat> Um, with with uh, uh, Umdawit at that time, yeah, I think he had it in for an hour more or less, because after that he took it out and his his nose was 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 cleared. So yeah, I haven't tried it myself. Um, so I'm not saying try it, please don't try it. But this is what he did uh, a few years back. Okay, uh, Modi uh, says yeah, definitely works on blue bottle burns. Um, that I think the builder asked. Use it when we we on. They use it when they're on holiday. Um, another question, yeah, uh, Edward uh, Edward Stewart Stalls. Um, thank you for a very informative session. Uh, is it possible to have a copy of the presentation? Um, that is from Henry. Oh yeah, I'm sure uh, that Clinton. Yeah, Clinton, you you have to answer there. Yes. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna go quickly to the Q and A because we have to move over to the next um, session. Uh, yeah, I'll, yeah. Do you sell permits to sell plants? I'm sure that we have to have permits to 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 sell plants. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Edward, um, and thank you very much for a very live audience. I can see that you are really yeah, enjoying it. Yes, Edward. No, I just want to say that Gail gave a nice, um, interesting. Um, a comment there about the, the tea. Yes, I see. And normally you make a tea with wilde owls and good for stomach problems. Thanks, Kyle. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much, Edward. Uh, I think it was very informative. Let me also highlight again that uh, if you have any other questions regarding medicinal plants, you can direct your questions to learning at capenature.co.za. We will revert back to you with the informed uh, answers and responses. I am now going to hand over um, to the next uh, presenter who is going to talk all about Gil's Plat Anna. Um, so I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Ernst Bart. He is the Executive Director for Operations Conservation. So welcome Ernst. Um, and then I will hand it over to you. Thanks Ernst. Thank you, Clinton. Good afternoon to all the viewers and the listeners. Uh, it's really, again, a privilege to be able to, and thanks for the invite, and a privilege to, to share a number of uh, thoughts and a few slides on, on the topic. I am sharing my uh, screen right now. Um, and uh, the invite was about uh, Gil's Plat Anna, uh, which is also otherwise known as the, as the Cape Plat Anna or the Kaapse Plat Anna in Afrikaans very interesting frog, um, but it's a frog also that you won't really see that easy. And that is why I titled my, uh, my presentation, what frog is that hiding in the black water? And uh, I'll get to that a little later on uh, Clinton, but I think, let me start by introducing our frogs or the amphibians as they're also known in English. But let me start with an interesting question that people uh, tend to, to worry sometimes about or, uh, and, and, and ask. So the question is, um, what is a frog or what is a toad? You know, is it a frog or is it a toad? And I'd like to share with the, with the viewers the fact that um, the statement that all toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. So let me read that again. If you're thinking about this, all our toads are frogs, but not all our frogs are toads. So, um, so that's an interesting one. And basically what that means is that all members of the class amphibia, that's the sort of the higher order um, of the category um, of the cl class amphib amphibian are frogs. But um, the order to which they uh, belong, the anura, the, the frogs, include 21 families, which amongst other include the toads, the bufonidae, as well as the Pippidae, who are the clawed frogs. Now, the subject of our talk this afternoon is the Cape Blood Anna, which is also one of two species 
of clawed frogs that you find in South Africa, and I'm going to get back to that. So in Afrikaans, it's basically about the, the, the paras and the skirva paras, and we'll, we'll, we'll um, look at that uh, in a while. However, let me then say that basically our frogs come in literally all shapes and sizes. The, uh, the smallest recorded frog in the world at the moment um, is somewhere in the Amazon uh, and the equatorial Guinea, uh, Guinea uh, rainforest. Uh, and they weigh in at around, well, weigh in, they measure in at around seven millimeters, which is not even your pinky nail um, that, that is, at, is that long. And then also the biggest frog in the world at the moment, the Goliath frog um, from, from the African plains, um, is the uh, it, it measures in at 34 centimeters. So that is, imagine a frog the size of a standard ruler that you have. Um, that, that's the size of those guys. Frogs also uh, occur on all continents, uh, except in Antarctica. It's a bit cold and a bit dry there. But uh, all in all, worldwide, we find about uh, 7,700 kinds, different kinds of frogs. And that, that's, that's quite, a, quite a stunning uh, number. But the interesting fact, uh, and maybe a fun fact for this afternoon is, uh, did you know that frogs can jump, they can crawl, they can walk, they can swim, they can burrow, they can climb trees, and they can even glide. So uh, at the end there, I mean, you get some frogs in the rainforest also that have got, uh, like frogs normally do, not all of them, but have got little, they've got webs between their toes. And as they jump or move from the one bush to the other, uh, the tree and so on, they actually literally use these, these feet of the, the webbed feet as little paraglides or, or paragliders or little parachutes or something. So that's why we say that they can even glide. The frog in the, in the picture, on the two pictures at the bottom there, is our famous bullfrog or the burl pada from South Africa. This is the biggest frog in South Africa. And the uh, interesting thing is that they occur more in the, in the drier parts of South Africa, in your uh, northern provinces and so on. And they live in pans uh, that fill up during the rainy season, mostly in, uh, in the northern provinces during summer. And the interesting thing is that when the pans dry up every year, they then dig themselves down or burrow into the, into the mud and they actually stay there until the next season. So they don't come out they, uh, they basically uh, go into almost a summer sleep, uh, into a winter sleep, and uh, then they wait for, uh, for the next summer rains to come. So that's a very interesting fact about uh, one of our frogs. But I think most of the viewers are familiar with frogs and how they live and their life cycles. But I quickly want to share, just say that, you know, um, the, the, the typical life cycle of our frogs is when it starts with our adult frogs, and the females, the males and the females that mate, the, uh, the females lay the eggs, uh, little tadpoles then hatch from these eggs. And eventually, as you can see, um, uh, in, I hope my, my cursor is, is visible, uh, the tadpole uh, moves through about four phases and grows into a little froglet. And have a notice and see that this, the tail of the, of the froglet, of the tadpole, actually gets absorbed. It doesn't fall off. It gets actually gets ab absorbed into the body of the little frog. And eventually, uh, the little froglet grows into, uh, into a, an adult frog. So that's, that's very typically the, the, uh, the life cycle of our frogs and how they, how they get about. Let me turn attention to the, to the frogs of the Western Cape. Uh, we have a number of very interesting frogs. As you can see, uh, 60, 60 kinds of frogs that live here or that occur in the Western Cape province. But the interesting fact is that more than half of our frogs in the Western Cape occurs only here in the Western Cape. They are endemic. Remember, it, uh, Edward also mentioned endemic plants that only grow here. So more than 50%, more than half of our frogs in the Western Cape only occurs here. And then the rest of them, the 24 others, occur both here and elsewhere in South Africa. As far as conservation is concerned, unfortunately, we have uh, 15 frogs that are, that are, uh, cons uh, uh, that are uh, of conservation concern. As you can see, five of them are critically endangered. And that basically just means that if we don't do something for the frogs and the habitat that they live in or the ecosystems that they live in, 
they stand a very good chance of actually going extinct. And that is a very, worry, a very worrying factor for us. Now, the, the, the second last bullet there is uh, something that I've added that uh, maybe not everybody is aware of, but um, our frogs are very, very good indicators of what we call in conservation terms, ecosystem health. In other words, let me illustrate this by saying is that if you arrive at a river or a mountain stream or a flay uh, somewhere on the coast or wherever you, you get a, a pan somewhere in the, in the, uh, in the Binnenland uh, and you hear a lot of frogs calling, you know, I'm thinking uh, KZN Pumalanga uh, Kruger National Park where you hear like hundreds, thousands of frogs calling at night. You can then assume that that ecosystem or that flay where the frogs live but it's actually pretty healthy because the frogs are healthy and they're happy and so on. And that's why we, we usually say healthy frogs, healthy environment. But um, Clinton and, and viewers, I want to introduce to you uh, three of our more interesting little frogs in the, in the Western Cape province be before I turn my attention to the, to the main feature. And that's the Table Mountain Ghost Frog, the Micro Frog and the Cape Rain Frog. So you'll see in the pictures on the left at the top, the, cable, uh, the Table Mountain Ghost Frog the Tafelbergs is para in Afrikaans, and the little microfrog, literally the microfrog. You can see the frog is sitting on someone, someone's finger there. Uh, they are very small. Um, and then the Cape rain frog, or the Kaapse Rienpara, also known in Afrikaans as the Young Blom. Many people will recognize that name as well. But let me just quickly say that the reason why I've chose these three frogs is just to illustrate the fact that our frogs, they occupy many, many different uh, environments, many different habitats, many, many homes, if I can put it that in, in sort of uh, uh, in, in, in human terms. So you will see in the top two pictures, the Table Mountain Ghost Frog occurs only in a few streams on the eastern side of Table Mountain. So if you are from the Cape and you look at, and you're at Kirsten Bosch and you look up onto the mountain, those streams going up onto, uh, onto Table Mountain, Skeleton Gorge, Window Gorge, and a few other streams. That is, listen to this, the only place in the world where the Table Mountain ghost frog lives. Nowhere else in the world. And as you can see in that top right-hand uh, corner, those, those typical streams coming down the gorges, that's where they live and that's where they hide um, and where they are very happy. The micro frogs, in, in contrast, they are mostly concentrated on the in the coastal area. And as you can see, uh, that picture there is of the Botrefir Flay or the Botrefir Estuary and the associated uh, blackwater lakelets. Um, and make a note of what I'm saying, blackwater lakelets. Um, and that's where they stay again in these small little ponds, not, not, in, the, not in the sea water or not in the estuary, but on the fringes in the freshwater lakelets. And then, of course, my one of my favorite frogs is the young blom or the Cape, uh, Cape rain frog. He's pretty ugly, but he is he's very happy. Uh, actually, is a very happy chappy that, uh, and his mother dresses him funny sometimes. But they they are a very interesting species that that actually cannot swim. Can you believe that a frog that can't swim? Um, the Cape rain frogs they are burrowing animals, so they live underground all the time and only comes out when when it's very wet during winter and when it rains. And as you can see on the photograph, they usually stay in the sandy areas of our coastal Feinbos areas. And the interesting fact about them again is they can't swim. So if you, if you put a Cape rain frog or a young blompada in water, he, he will drown. They cannot swim. You can look at those little feet and the legs. They just cannot swim. And that's why they live underground. They breed underground and uh, the, the eggs and the little ones also uh, develop underground. But let me switch attention then, uh, Clinton, to Gill's Platana or the Cape Platana, as we, as we know them, the Carpsa Plat Carpsa Platana, which was described in 1927 by Drs. Walter Rose and John Hewitt, two famous herpetologists in, uh, in the Cape in those, in those areas. And um, the scientific name Xenopus gili, the, the species name gili, just basically means uh, that it was described in honor of a, another famous international herpetologist, Dr. Gill. Now, the, the Cape Platana is very, very unique in the sense that it only occurs in the southwestern Cape province. Nowhere else in the world, nowhere else in South Africa, 
and it's only to be found in the Cape Peninsula on the Cape Flats on some of the some of the wetlands there, Betty's Bay, Hunklip area, and of course the Pearly Beach, Cape Agulla areas. But the interesting fact is that they only occur in, at low altitudes close to the sea uh, in these little freshwater lakelets. And I'll show you a picture of that just now. Unfortunately, the Cape Platana is endangered uh, and also at risk of, of extinction. And uh, the interesting fact is that if you take all the places, all the localities where we find Cape Platana and you put them together, sort of wall to wall and so on, it's only really a 60 square kilometer area that they occupy. That, that, that again, from a conservation point of view, is very high risk for these animals. Fortunately, where you find Cape, Cape Platanas, they are reasonably abundant. There's many of them. Uh, and we know now exactly where we find them and more or less how many of them are there. But unfortunately, in the Cape Platanas case, the populations are very few and far in between. And that is a big worry for us at the moment. Uh, the last bullet just indicates also that there is some genetic divergence between these populations, but I'm, I'm not going to dwell on that right now. So where can you find the Cape Platana then? Uh, this very rough map that I have put on the screen here will indicate to you that they occur um, more or less as I've indicated, and I hope you can see the cursor on the Cape Peninsula and the associated wetlands of the Cape Point Nature Reserve, and then also in the Claymont Betis Bay area, right down on the coast, as well as in the uh, Cape Agalas, the Dam area uh, the, the, the next to Pearly Beach and those areas in those uh, water, uh, in those uh, freshwater lakelets that, that you find there. So where do, where do Cape Platanas live then? You know, so uh, I, as I've mentioned, they occur only in famous coastal shrublands. They live in very small coastal freshwater lakelets. These are typically uh, what we call the black water lakelets. Now, why do I say black water lakelets? It is because the water, the water quality is very pure. It's very, it's very clean water, but the water is very interesting in that it's humic. It, it contains a lot of organic material and it's very dark in color. So as the water, as the fresh water from the rivers and the streams flow through the pain boss roots uh, um, down into the flays and so on, it picks up all kinds of tannins and, and colorants from the from the fine boss roots. And that's why the color the, the color of the of the water is very dark. It's actually, it looks like Coke uh, or a very strong cup of tea. And it typically is very, it has a very low pH value. What does that mean? That just means that the water is very acidic. Um, and uh, Cape Platanas typically breeds in winter and they also estivate when their bodies dry up. Remember I said, that in the case of the bullfrog in the Benelant areas, uh, they go and bury, uh, bury themselves into the mud. Exactly the same with the Cape Platanas is that also during the dry season, when these bod water bodies dry up, they would then uh, dig themselves or bury themselves deep under the mud. And that's where they stay and wait until the winter rains next year come again. Now, the interesting thing is that they also, in these areas, they also occur together with the common platanas. So that's the second species that we get down here, which is more abundant species. And unfortunately, as the next slide will show, the common platana in the top right-hand corner over here is the culprit. And unfortunately, because they are so strong, so abundant, so tolerant of, of the environment, they outcompete the, uh, they outcompete the, the, the Cape platana and where they occur together, Unfortunately, the common platana outcompetes them and also crossbreeds with the Cape platana. And that's also, from a conservation point of view, quite a threat. Of course, invasive alien plants, as we all know, down here in the Bolland, in the Cape area, always is a problem reducing habitat quality. And then, of course, when we lose habitat, uh, when we lose these ecosystems, it's always a, uh, always a threat to the, to the, uh, to the uh, natural habitats that we down there. And of course, many of the Cape Platanas, which is, the, which is the, the more rare species, have been part of the big platana trade in the past, in the 1940s and 50s, when thousands, literally thousands of platanas were caught and, uh, and, and sent overseas uh, as laboratory animal, animals. And also, interestingly enough, as, uh, as, as animals that were used in pregnancy testing. Very interesting quick fact. 
is they found out in those years that if you inject a plot on a female with the urine of a pregnant female, a pregnant a woman, um, the plot on our female would then immediately start developing eggs and start laying eggs. So that's a sure sign that the human woman is pregnant. That's a very interesting fact that you can you can go and have a, a, a look look at later on. So, uh, Clinton, I'm 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 ending my presentation by saying is that we are fortunate that from a conservation point of view, uh, many populations of the Cape Blood Anna occur both in Table Mountain National Park, the Agalas National Park. Uh, there's also specifically some uh, uh, interventions uh, done in terms of removing of common plot anas from these populations. And I think that many, many landowners also realize that they can do a lot for Cape Blood Anas by doing good land management, keeping the ponds clean and not allowing these ponds to be, to be polluted and so on. And of course, the, the thing that we are doing today is to raise awareness to, to, to raise appreciation for these, for these threatened species. And in that way, we can, we, can, we can educate people and make them aware of the pledge of all of these uh, very rare and threatened species. So Clinton, with that, I'm going to say thank you very much for the invite once again. And uh, it was a great pleasure sharing this with you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bart. I can see that there are quite a number of uh, questions and uh, I hope you are ready. I think there's about what's it, 15 questions just for you. <laughs> How can frogs survive in Antarctica? Where are the most frogs in the world? How big is the bullfrog? <laughs> sure. Yeah, frogs, as I've mentioned, that there are no frogs in Antarctica. It's just too cold and icy and, and, and in fact, it's very dry there. But uh, how big is the bullfrog? I think the bullfrog is around, if I can, if I can, um, my hand, if you can see my hand, it's basically the size of my hand that it would, it would be able to fit on. Um, what is the smallest frog in South Africa? At the moment, the microfrog, as we have indicated, the microfrog of the Western Cape province is considered the smallest frog in the, in the Western Cape province. Um, hi, Mignan. Uh, okay, yes. What role do those endangered frogs play in the ecosystem? What would be the outcome if they were to die off? Okay, that's an interesting question, and I think one always has to take into account what does it mean. What what are, what what does it mean to have frogs in the environment? And I think the the the, the one of the answers is that many frogs form the basic prey and food of many other animals. So if yes. many of those frogs die out and are not available anymore, then the animals that eat them, like the birds and some snakes um, and, and, and so on, will not have enough food to, to eat. And then of course, also frogs, um, again, makes a very important, and that, uh, yeah, the reason why that, why I'm saying is that it's a very important part of the food chain. So uh, that would be one of the important roles that they play. Okay. Um, the other thing is um, just a, a last question because we have to move over to the next uh, presenter, which is also going to be very interesting. I can assure you that is um, what types of frogs do you have in in the reserves uh, in your reserves or in our reserves? I'm assuming that's from uh, Paris. Clinton, the the the, the uh, because. Cape Nature and the Western Cape have got so many different kinds of environments and habitats and ecosystems. And because our nature reserves cover a lot of those ecosystems um, and, and, and habitats and so on, we have a very good uh, example of all the frogs of the Western Cape province in most of our protected areas. So I would say that we, we, we have a good, very good complement. I cannot give the figures as I sit here but we have a very, very good complement of the Western Cape frogs in the whole network of Cape Nature, Nature Reserves in the Western Cape. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Bart. Um, as I said, you can always direct your questions to learning at capenature.co.za. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think there's a lot of questions um, that I did not um, answer or respond to. Um, we will uh, direct that questions to you, uh, Dr. Bart. Um, and now uh, we are moving over to the next um, presentation.
Thank you, which, thank you very much, Dr. Bart. Um, now we are looking for a specific uh, something, a, a very interesting animal. Um, his name is, I don't know. Um, so I'll hand over to Dr. Marien uh, de Villiers. Uh, Marien, welcome. Um, and I'm hope, I know that you will, you will find the character that we're looking for. Welcome. Thanks very much, Clinton. And thank you everybody for um, listening to the talk today. I hope that you can see my screen there. And there we go. Clinton, is that, is that clear? That's perfect. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So today I'm going to be talking about the mystery of Boersman's long-tailed forest shrew. And where's Waldo or where's Wally, which I included in the title of the, of the talk, is it's a children's puzzle book that some of you may be familiar with. And the aim of these puzzles is to find Wally in some kind of complicated landscape where you have to search for him. Now that's quite a nice analogy to species conservation because when we try to conserve species, we have to be able to answer at least three basic questions. What is it that we're dealing with? Where does it occur? And thirdly, how many of them are there? And are the numbers going up or going down? So in this particular Wally puzzle, the answer, the, the question what is quite clear. We're looking for Wally or Waldo, and he's this little guy with a striped top and a beanie and a walking stick. Where he is in this particular puzzle, he's somewhere, it looks like maybe in the Swiss Alps. And how many of him are there? Well, if you look closely at the picture, there's quite a few little guys there that look like they could be Wally. But in fact, if you were able to zoom in, you'd see that in fact, the only real Wally is the one circled there in red. So in the Wally comics, there can only be one. Now, coming back to conservation, in South Africa, we have six critically endangered mammal species. Critically endangered means that they're on the verge of going extinct if we don't do something about it. And for a big animal like that black rhino, it's fairly easy to answer the questions, what, where, and how many. Quite easy to find them, quite easy to count them. For smaller animals like the river iron rabbit pictured on the, on the right hand side, maybe not so easy to answer those questions. So they're very shy animals, they're mostly active at night. We thought we had a really good idea of what they were, but now scientists are beginning to think that maybe they're two different subspecies of this particular mammal. Where they occur, we also thought we knew that, we thought they occurred in the Nama Karoo, but in 2003, a population of river iron rabbits was discovered in the Little Karoo. So we had to adjust our thinking about where they are. And then as recently as two years ago, a brand new population of river iron rabbits was found in the eastern part of the Western Cape province near Bavianskloof. So we're still not entirely sure the, uh, what the answer is to the where. And how many they are, well, that's something we just don't know. So you can imagine that if it's hard to answer those basic questions for an animal like a river iron rabbit, it's even harder to answer it for a small animal like a shrew. And before I talk more about the forest shrews, I just want to give you a little bit of background about shrews in general. So this photograph here is not of a South African species. It's a Uziri white toothed shrew, but it illustrates some of the main characteristics of shrews. The first thing is that they're really tiny. They're very small and they have an extremely high metabolic rate. Because of that, they need to eat almost continuously and the types of things that they eat are mostly insects. They will occasionally take frogs and other things. Some of them will even eat seeds of plants. But they have to eat almost continuously in order to sustain their high me metabolism. How do they find their prey? Well, you can see in this photo that their eyes are really tiny. Um, and they don't use their eyes to find prey because they're mostly active at night and they occupy really dense vegetation. What they do rely on are those really long whiskers that they use to find, find their prey. Um, and then basically, if you think about a shrew, they're kind of the equivalent, the mammalian of, equivalent of a hummingbird. They have this really high heart rates, anything from between 800 to 1000 beats per minute. And that compares to humans where heart rates range from generally about 60 to maximum 100 beats per minute. 
There's some speculation that they may even use echolocation to find their prey like bats do, but that has never been proven. So coming to the South African shrews, the first thing that you need to know about shrews is that they belong to the order Insectivora because they basically mostly eat insects. And in South Africa, we know about three different genera of shrews. The firstly are the forest shrews, also known as the mouse shrews. And that's the group I'm gonna dig into today, the genus Myosarex. Then they're the dwarf shrews, which belong to the genus Syncus. And lastly, the musk shrews, which belong to Crossodura. There's, um, Sengis have made the news lately because of a discovery of a new species, not in South Africa, but Sengis are completely unrelated to shrews. So they, they used to be called elephant shrews, but they're not elephants and they're not shrews. So for very good reason, their English name has changed to the Sengi. They belong to a completely different order. And in fact, Sengis and true shrews are as different from one another as, for example, a cheetah is from, let's say, an impala. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about that first genus, Myosarex. And basically, this is a kind of a, det a biological detective story which began in 1976, when a worker at the Dipwala Forest near Neisner found a shrew that he thought looked a bit strange. He showed it to a visiting researcher and the researcher took that specimen up to the Transvaal Museum, where it came to the attention of two scientists, Professor Johan Meester and Nico Dippenar. And really what, what kind of fits in very nicely with my story is that Johan Meester's nickname was Waldo. So Meester and Dippenar looked at the specimen, thought, yes, it does seem to be something different. And as a result, Dippenar went off back to the Nisner Forest did some sampling around there, collected more specimens and brought them back to the laboratory. He then did various tests, measured their skulls, did all sorts of morphometric measurements. And as a result, Meester and Dippenau concluded that in fact, this new kind of shrew is, was a new species and they named it Myosarex longicordatus. Now in Latin, longi means long and cordatus means tail. So basically the name is very, of the species is very descriptive. It means long tail. And that was appropriate because this particular shrew, the, the um, length of the tail was about three quarters the length of the body. So um, Longicordatus has very specific habitat requirements and it's only ever been found in patches of indigenous intact forest or on the edges of those forests, what we call the ecotone with fainbos. This, trawling through the internet, this was the only photograph I could find of Masarex longicordatus, and it was taken way back in the 1970s, in fact, by Nico Dippenau. And that's quite interesting in the modern day of information technology. It just gives you an idea of how mysterious and poorly known this particular species is. Before I get on to more about Longicordatus, I just want to give you an idea of where it fits in, in amongst South African shrews of that genus. And this illustration is from a paper written by Peter Taylor and co-authors and published in 2013. It looks a bit complicated, but the message that I want to pull out here is, is quite simple. Really what we're looking at in this diagram, it's a relationship tree and Species that are most close, closely related are most closely clustered together. So uh, Peter Taylor and his co-authors say that there are five species of uh, Masarex as opposed to the three that were originally known. Those are Scleteri, Hafer, Various, Tenuous, and then of course our hero Longicordatus. And you can see that Longicordatus is clustered far away from all of the other South African shrews. On the right-hand side of the diagram, there's a, a scale, and that provides an idea of when it is thought that these different species diverged from one another and became separated. So Longicordatus sitting all the, on its own away from all the other South African species is believed to have diverged more than 12 million years ago. 
So it's a really, really ancient species, quite, quite a primitive species. Going back in time again, Nico Dipinar um, went back to the Neisner area and he did some more sampling for these forest shrews, but he also extended his search into the, into the Langeberg. And he recorded Miserix longicordatus at five different sites. Four fall in that dotted area in the map, that's the Neisner forest area, but the fifth was found in the Boersmans Bors wilderness area, high up in the Langeberg mountains, and probably the closest um, town there is Heidelberg. So if we extend that analogy of where's Wally or Waldo, Waldo would be Boersmans Bors forest true, but the other forest trues, the Neisner forest trues, we would call maybe Oddlaw, which if you're a fan of the, of the, of the puzzle books, Oddlaw was um, Wally's arch enemy. So what was interesting to Dipinar was that these shrews that he found in Boersman's Bors wilderness area were different from the Neisner shrews. The, the length of their tail, their skull characteristics, all sorts of things suggested to him and in fact, what we're dealing with are two separate subspecies. On the one hand, we have Myosarex longicordatus Boersmanii. I know it's a heck of a tongue twister, but that is Boersman's long-tailed forest shrew. And then he hypothesized that the shrew in the Neisner forest, Myosarex longicordatus longicordatus, was a completely different subspecies. Why would there be this, these differences? This is just a Google Earth photo showing all of the locations that we've now know where Miserix occurs. And that blue line indicates the position of the Choritz River Valley. So Dipinar proposed that that Choritz River Valley acts as a geographic barrier that separated the Boersmans forest true from the Neisner forest trues. Okay, so moving on. Oh, I think I might have skipped a slide, so let me, no, good. So um, the trapping results from the 1990s that were done by, the, that was done by Dipinar suggested a few things about these shrews. It improved our knowledge immensely. It showed firstly that they seem to really rely on moist habitat on the ecotone on the edge between Feinbos and forest. And it also suggested that long tail that they're probably tree living, they are boreal, which is fairly unusual amongst trees in general. Then he analyzed the stem, stomach contents of some of the animals that he trapped. And he, it looks as though they feed on insects, but also to a large degree on seeds as well. And from our understanding now, we believe that they only occur in an area of about 10 square kilometers at high altitudes there in the Longeberg mountains. So this, the, the, this, these maps are from a quite recent paper published in 2017, again by Peter Taylor. And what he did was to look at climate change predictions and try and predict what is going to happen to the distribution of shrews as a result of climate change. And really what this paper indicates is that probably one of the biggest threats to Myosarex longicordatus is in fact climate change. The reasons for this are firstly, because they can't move very far. They have what, what is known as a poor dispersal capability. Then that very high metabolic rate means that they're very sensitive to temperature extremes. And we know that one of the predictions of climate change is that there are likely to be more and more extreme uh, weather events and Miserix longicordatus will be affected by that. Um, they also, these trees are also very sensitive to habitat destruction and habitat fragmentation. And being restricted to these indigenous forest patches, they have to be in con good condition to support the shrew, means that habitat loss is a very real threat to them. This text is taken from the Red List account for Myosarex longicordatus. And at the top there, we have the regional status for the subspecies that occurs in the Neisner forest, and it is classified as endangered. Underneath it, the population in the Longeberg Mountains, Wally, is classified as critically endangered on the edge of extinction. On the right-hand side, if you look at the data sources and quality that are used for this red list assessment, 
you'll see words like indirect, inferred, estimate, and evidentiary. And what all of those words suggest to us is that we really don't know how to answer the, those three basic questions very well. Firstly, the what. We think that Waldo is probably a subspecies of Myosurix longicordatus, but we don't know for sure and we need more samples to, to, to work that out. Where does it occur? It seems pretty definite that it occurs only in Boersmans Bors, but it might be that we just need to look harder. It's not an easy to find species and maybe it's, it's, it's been existing all the time at places where we've never looked. And then lastly, as to how many of them, well, I have to say that we just don't have a clue. So where to now? Well, there was a survey of the Longeberg Mountains way back in 1989, and it suggested a couple of, of forest remnants that might in fact support the species. The problem is that the mountains, as you can see from this photograph, are extremely rugged. There's very little vehicle access, so it's going to be a complete mission to try and search them to find this tiny little shrew. But that is on the cards. It's something that we're hoping to do soon and also to go back and resurvey the Neisner forest for the other subspecies, which uh, the, the last survey for that subspecies was more than 20 years ago. And I'd just like to finish off by saying thank you to everybody that provided information and photographs that I've used for this presentation. But in particular, a huge thank you to Nico Dipinar, who very generously shared with me his great experience and, and knowledge about, about um, Waldo. Thanks very much to everybody for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Marianne. Um, a lot of information, a lot of interesting information. I've got a few questions um, coming from a lot of people. Uh, how small is the smallest shrew? I'm not sure what the size of the smallest shrew is, but these animals are tiny. And this Boersmans forest shrew, for example, is about 15 centimeters long. But most, a lot of that 15 centimeters is tail. So you can imagine the body is tiny. They only weigh about 15 grams. There are smaller shrews in the world, um, but for, for, South, for the Western Cape, um, Wally is one of our smallest. Thank you. Uh, the opposite of that is, how big is the biggest shrew? Wow, well, that's, that's a good question. And I have to say, I don't actually know what the answer is. Um, it's something I'm gonna have to find out. Where was the first shrew uh, found? Whoa. You know, interestingly, the archeological remains of ancient, ancient sh uh, shrews that are now extinct. Um, and I think probably the earliest known uh, fossil shrew, let's say, is from the, Trans the old Transvaal province. Um, if shrews die out, what will happen? Yeah. It's easy to think that because they're so small, they're probably not very important, but actually they, they perform a really important role in ecosystems. So on the one hand, they help to control populations of insects. I mentioned that they mostly eat insects. They take things like crickets. They also eat snails and other things as well. And so they can be really important in controlling the populations of, priest, of, of pests. And then of course, they also are prey for many species. So they're an important food source that helps keep bigger animals on the go. And I think just like if you look at ecosystems as being webs with inter interrelated elements, if you break any um, strand of that web, the whole thing collapses. And that's true for taking shrews out of an ecosystem as well. Just the last comment. Um, I see uh, there's somebody saying, how appropriate for World Rhino Day, which was yesterday. So I think the shrew the correlation is it was World Rhino Day yesterday. So yeah, it's how appropriate it is because the shrews are, I think we, uh, few of them are remaining. Thank True, you very yeah. much. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, uh, I, was, I, I was just gonna say in response to that, maybe we need to initiate to have a World Shrew Day as well. Thank I was just thinking, <laughs> I was thinking exactly the same thing. Thank you very much, uh, Marianne. Um, audience, you can, if you have any additional questions, you may uh, send them to learning at capenature.co.za. Um, and now for the last but not least, um, finding 
the Two River Red Fin. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Dr. Martin Jordan. Uh, Martin, welcome. And the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Clinton. I just want to make sure I actually uh, don't share anything with you. I shouldn't share with you, namely that I just get the, um, the right presentation to you. Um, Okay, can everyone see my uh, my um, my presentation? I just need to quickly sort something here. Okay, um, thank you everyone for for your time and for your interest here. Um, I'm a fauna ecologist at Cape Nature, and fauna ecologist generally means I work with just about not not every and any animal species, but most animal species. Um, but uh, the freshwater fish of the region are by far my favorite. I've been fish crazy since I was a kid. So I'm hoping to um, not only help you guys find a tour of a redfin tonight, but also give you a bit of background about the, the fish of the, of the region. Okay, so before I get to the, uh, the fish of the region and um, why it's all important, um, I just want to take a step back for a global view on biodiversity. And this is sort of along the map that uh, Edward also touched on. Um, from, we, from, what, from this map, we can see that while the Cape, Cape touristic region is really, really small, it's one of five global biodiversity hotspots. This just means that in terms of biodiversity, the Cape touristic region is comparable to um, regions, regions such as the tropical Central African rainforest, the Amazon basin, which I think is on most naturalists' uh, to-do lists and bucket lists, um, the Mesoamerican region, and also the very biodiverse island of Madagascar. So if we take a, um, a step closer and consider the Cape Touristic region from an aquatic perspective, we'll see that spatially it corresponds to the Cape Fold ecoregion. So the Cape Touristic region, Cape Fold ecoregion is the same thing spatially, but the Cape Fold ecoregion is one of six aquatic regions of Southern Africa. This, um, the Cape Fold ecoregion or CFE hereafter, it's located mainly within the Western Cape, but it also spans a little bit into the, the Eastern Cape province. The region is characterized by geomorphological and climatic complexity and high numbers of isolated river systems. This has favored speciation in freshwater fish, which has resulted in a unique fauna with high levels of endemism. And if you just also quickly think back of endemism, my um, fellow presenter spoke about it. Endemic just means it's only found in a certain place, nowhere else. So a lot of the fish of the region are only found within the Cape Cod ecoregion, and this endemic to the region, but also to down to sort of isolated river system level. So a fish endemic to say the Berg River or the Breda or the Haritz River is only found there and not in any other regions. So if we just um, look at the families of fish in the Western, uh, in the Cape Cod eco region, there's four families and 21 described species. These are the Anabantids and the Galaxids, um, one species per genus um, that's currently described. And these are widespread throughout the Cape Cod eco region. Then it's the Cyprinidae family, which um, I'm hoping they'll be a little bit better known, the redfins and the yellow fishes, um, 17 species in total, and generally one to four per river system. And then there are the uh, last but not least, the little rock catlets, and these are endemic to the Olifantuan river system in the western part of the province. And these uh, are not to be confused with like the African shop tooth catfish, which is um, not the same thing. I'll get to that later. Um, so having said that there's only 21 species, um, in addition to these known species, ongoing research is indicating that there's actually more species in the region than currently described. And this we know based on genetic studies, and to date there are 45 known freshwater fish taxa in the region. So while we only have 21 that's described, by the time everything is fully described and all this taxonomic and morphological work is completed, the number of species in the, in the region could double. Um, an example of the of of such a species that's got this hidden cryptic diversity, Adams also referred to it in some of the frogs, is um, a species called the Cape Galaxias or Galaxias zebratus. It's endemic to the Cape Cod ecoregion. And historically, if you look at the, I hope you can see the cursor, if you look at the top map here, it was originally just believed to be like widespread through all the systems in the region, sort of up from the, the regions, um, the Olifantuan on the west coast here, out to like the, the Hamtua system in the Eastern Cape. Um, but based on genetic work that's underway, it could be 14 genetically unique lineages. And I've got six on the, the bottom map here. And these taxa, some of them will be described as full species. Um, but even if something is just a unique taxon and not a full species, it still warrants conservation and management as a single species to, um, to conserve and um, 
ensure genetic um, purity and integrity of that lineage. And I just want to take a, a quick second here to um, acknowledge the South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity. Um, they do a lot of the taxonomic and genetic work in the country, and also the friendly fellow on the left here is Dr. Albert Tracona, who's doing um, the bulk of the taxonomy at, at, at SIAB. And um, yeah, we've just, uh, we've been collaborating for about a decade and basically every new fish species that's being described for the region and also for the country is, Albert is somehow involved. So just wanna acknowledge his um, commitment and hard work as well. So yeah, so here's just an example of what the uh, the Cape Galaxias looks like. It's a beautiful little fish, it's tiny. It's, um, well, I don't have particularly big hands, but it's about the size of, of my pinky. And the one in the top photo here is gonna be the classic Cape um, Cape Galaxias, Galaxias abratus, and the pictures down here just shows what some of the other lineages looks like. And to the untrained eye, these things look exactly similar or very similar, but they are very um, subtle morphological differences such as relative body depth, which is sort of the, the, the width of the fish to body length, um, as well as things like relative eye, si eye size and relative eye placement. Like the little guy on the left here has got this little beady eye that's set quite back, whereas the fish in the middle has got a relatively bigger eye, and then this guy's got a bigger eye set slightly more forward. So all these morphological characteristics, as well as the genetic research, at the end of the day determines whether something is a new species or not. So this brings us to conservation status. What is it? And more importantly, why does it matter? Why should we be worried? Conservation status is an indication of future extinction risk of a species. Um, there are several categories. Um, the, the absolute worst you can be is extinct, which means you do not exist anymore. As a species, you are lost to mankind. The last one of your kind has died and you are, yeah, your history. <laughs> then it goes through all the, the threatened categories and the probably best position to be in is a least concerned species. Um, these are species that are relatively common and unlikely to be at risk of extinction in the near future. So how do we assess conservation status. The assessments are done generally, well, preferably every five years, but generally every 10 years, and based on standardized criteria from the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, better known as the IUCN. And factors affecting conservation, sta conservation status include population size, reproductive success. Is it something that breeds a lot of offspring in quick succession, or is it something that has like one offspring every few years? So it's all about reproductive success and how quickly the the animals can reproduce, the extent of occurrence, is it occurring in quite a big area, is it occurring in quite a small area, what is threatening it, um, how easy are the threats to mitigate, are the active interventions on the go, so all these things feed into um, a standardized assessment to determine conservation status. So if you look at the conservation status of the fish of the Cape Floristic, uh, Cape Fold ecoregion, um, these are the two most recent assessments, the dark bars are 2009 and the lighter bars are 2017, we see that there's a reduction in critically endangered taxa, which is a really good thing because we had four taxa critically endangered, we now only have three. Sadly, this is not a result of the species actually doing better, but there were new distribution records um, discovered for those species. So we actually have more than we thought we had, so that um, resulted in a, in a reduction in, in critically endangered taxa. But also we see an increase in the endangered and near threatened taxa. This is a result of the formal assessment of new lineages that were not evaluated in 2019. If you look at this big um, not evaluated bar here for 2009, there's nothing for 2017, which basically means that all these animals or all these taxa that were not assessed has now moved into, a lot of them have moved into the endangered category and some into the near threatened cat category. And this is actually quite worrisome because um, many of these new, newly discovered taxa are range restricted and threatened despite not even being formally described species yet, which I think is quite a bad position to be in. Like, we've just discovered you, we don't really know anything about you, yet we know you endangered and at risk of extinction. I mean, if I was a fish, I'd be pretty worried. And why are these fish so threatened? Um, this is sort of the, the question that leads from the, the conservation status stuff. Um, many species are under threat, threat from the loss of habitat. This is a result of poor land use practices, water over extraction, pollution, urban expansion. I think it's it's easy to see if we just look around around us at the at the environment to see how much land is lost from being natural and being transformed to either agricultural or residential land. Um, yeah, and also I think with a day zero water crisis still relatively fresh in our minds, I think it's 
it's quite easy to see why something that is completely dependent on, on fresh water for its survival can actually be at risk when, when there's no water. Um, the primary threat, however, to many species is the impacts associated with predatory invasive fish. South Africa as a whole is an alien invasive fish hotspot with more than 20 species having been introduced since the 1850s. If you look at the map here, um, especially at the brown and the black, which makes up most of the map, is the areas where there's e between seven and 12 non-native species either present or established. These species include popular angling species such as bass and trout, and they can excipate native species due to predation, press predation pressure. And given the pressures on indigenous fish and their associated habitat, we want to know, are they safe in protected areas such as nature reserves? The short answer is sadly, no, they are not. Um, and this is based on the current assessment that formed part of the um, National Biodiversity Assessment. Of the 27 fish taxa assessed, 70% were either not protected or poorly protected. And what this means is that for a conservation target set at 10,000 individuals or 10 populations, uh, less than 50% of that target was met within formally protected areas. And only 11% of taxa were considered well protected, meaning that 100% or more of the conservation target was met within protected areas. This is not directly a result of protected area management. So it's not that protected areas are managed badly and that's why fish are suffering. This is rather a case or a, a result of protected area placement. If we look at sort of the protected area network of the Western Cape, there is a bias towards mountainous high altitude areas. So if, unless a fish species is a headwater specialist or quite adapted to live in these little headwater streams, um, then most of them, they would be safe. But also there are a lot of fish that are living in mainstream rivers and are lowland species. And these are also the areas that are most likely to be um, converted to agricultural land. It's um, valuable land in terms of, of, uh, of agriculture and, and um, and development for residential purposes. So if you're a lowland species, which a lot of the species are, you are outside a protected area and you are more vulnerable to threats. The other thing is also that rivers are continuous systems. The alien fish or the alien plants or whatever the threat is, they don't know where the reserve boundary is. So yeah, if there's, if the headwaters of the river is not protected and yeah, so it's just this continuity of river systems that makes them so difficult to protect. So, um, yeah, it's just the take home message is that a lot of lowland species are really, really at risk. So this finally brings us to finding and hopefully protecting the Tuer River Redfin. Why did I choose this species as an, as an example? It is critically endangered, it's poorly protected, it's highly range restricted, as it occurs only in a single little catchment near Citrus Dole within the Olifant Durung River system. So yeah, the, the colored area here is the whole system. This fish is endemic to to a very, very small area. So just um, moving over to the map, the, the black lines here is the rivers where this fish was historically present. And these little yellow bits here just shows the current population and it persists as a, um, a, in terms of like little fragmented populations within the, uh, within the historical distribution range. The threat to the species um, includes habitat degradation, agrichemical agri agri pollution, because a lot of the Tuya River is um, subject to intensive um, deciduous and um, um, citrus fruit farming. There's high water demand during the summer months and there's a number of invasive species, alien and invasive fish species that are established in the catchment. So to end on a good note, um, a conservation translocation um, of these red fins were done to the Seaflay, from the Seaflay River to the Tainscliff Dam in 2008. It was a meager 48 individuals that were, that were translocated. Um, here's a photo of the dam. The fish were released and to a large extent forgotten about for 10 years. Resampling happened in 2015 and voila, almost 3,000 fish from just three netting efforts. And if you can look at the bottom picture here, these nets are not very big. So to get 1,000 fish in each of them, knowing that you put in 48 just a decade ago, was really amazing news. It shows that um, the species has successfully established, there's now a refuge population, um, yeah, this is the um, uh, uh, size distribution graph. It shows at least four generations present. Um, there's big fish of over like 120 millimeters, which shows they're probably quite old, unlikely to be some of the founding stock, but yeah, these are fish of like five, six years old. However, they still need to focus on conservation of, of the species and many other species in the wild. Because even though this is like really a feel good story and we can all be happy that our 
that our efforts paid off. This is no different than a panda bear in a zoo. You cannot protect species by just protecting numbers. You've got to protect genetic diversity. You've got to protect the natural processes which has led to the evolution of this fish. So yeah, so you can't just go like, hey, we've done well, we do have um, thousands of minnows. We do need to think bigger and think of um, genetic diversity and um, conserving the species in the wild. So how do we protect these valuable and highly threatened fish for the future? We need to be, we need to increase awareness of the species as well of the region, as well as the relevant threats. We can't conserve something if we're blissfully unaware of it. We need to partner with private landowners to participate in conservation initiatives, especially given the poor protection of species within the, within the current protected area network. We need to go and find out where the important areas are, engage those landowners and say, you've got something really special in your rivers, please work with us to protect it. We need to expand protected areas through stewardship initiatives. But the important thing here is freshwater conservation priorities must be included in conservation planning. Otherwise, if we miss those, we can increase the conservation estate through signing up stewardship initiatives and signing up areas and just having more and more land protected. But if freshwater conservation priorities are not feeding into where we are expanding, we could be expanding and actually not conserving our fish in the future. So thank you for your, uh, for your time and your interest. Um, and I just also want to thank um, all the collaborators from with Cape Nature who's been um, tirelessly working to um, contribute to the conservation of the indigenous fish community of the region. And I want to leave you with some uh, very pretty red fins swimming in the uh, one of the tributaries of the, uh, the Breda River. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. That was very interesting. And there are a few questions. Um, the first one was is from uh, Dr. Kas Harman. Uh, 20 years ago, Sandelia, I hope I'm pronouncing the word correctly. Sandelia Capensis were, yeah, yeah. were introduced in the Fragile Tree River Redfin habitat. Any idea what the impact of this introduction had on the local population? OK. Um, the, well, based on the most recent sampling, which was done about five years ago, the Sandelia is the most common species in that river system now. In the areas where they've been, at sort of where the habitat is quite suitable to them, they are a dime a dozen. I think we also set a fight net and got about 400 up. So they, they're very, very abundant species. They're also quite hardy. So, whether, so in the areas where the Sandelia is now dominant, it's also in the areas where there's quite a bit of agricultural impact. So looking at the historical records of where the minnows were and where the sandelia are now, we're not sure why the minnows disappeared. Is it an issue around um, agricultural pollution because there is pesticide pollution in the area or was it a competition effect from the, um, from the sandelia? So teasing those two effects out are, are quite difficult, but I'm hoping that um, with more monitoring and more work, we can, we can answer that question. Thank you. Uh, then also, uh, he is say something about the importance of Calexias uh, within the Gondwana context, Martin. Okay, yeah, uh, I must get this right. I actually had this explained to me by uh, Professor Paul Skelton, who um, was also the author of the uh, of the field <laughs> guide. Um, the uh, um, Galaxias, I think, what they call a Gondwanan relic. So they only occur. Um, in, yeah, in what used to be, if you think back to like how the continents were before they had their current um, current configuration. Um, yeah, so the, the galaxids are, um, yeah, there's no galaxid in the Northern Hemisphere that only exist in the, um, in New Zealand, Australia, um, South Africa, and um, what's the Southern end of South America? Ch Ch Chile, no, not yes. Chile. Um, but anyway, the, the bottom part of South America was like in the, like Gondwana land, all those land masses were one. So the species only could, or not the species, the, um, the galaxids could only occur there. And as these land masses moved over like millions of years to what we have now, we can see that those were all like historically, so they all have the same ancestors. And there's a, I think it's in this, a New Zealand species, it's called a kokapu. It's like such a silly word, but it's basically a galaxias that we used the galaxid being this tiny little fish like the size of my pinky. And if you go and Google a kokapu, it's a galaxias, but it's like this big. It's like a trout. It's the, yeah, being a fish biologist, it just messes with your mind that there's something so similar somewhere else, but just like a hundred times bigger. It's it's really fascinating. So there's something for people to go and Google just, after this. 
Thank you, uh, Martin. Just another question um, is, uh, are people generally taking uh, freshwater conservation seriously? That's from Koseja Nampa. Yeah, that's, personally, I think that's quite a, a difficult question to answer because I think, yeah, I think you have the whole spectrum. You have people that are mm. incredibly passionate about conservation and private citizens who will, I mean, I've been involved in a, in a project in Barrydale because there's also a really like highly threatened minnow there. And there are people that literally, it's like, what can we do for the minnow? We really want to help it. And, you know, we really care about it. And within the same community, there'll be people, you know, mm. who just, you know, want to, favor you know financial gain over conservation gain um mm. and i really don't care much about sustainable water use but it's also difficult i think selling conservation if you because i mean with, with fish conservation you can't really talk rands and cents i mean they're not oh if you can conserve the fish you know you can like fish for it and farm it or whatever it's a very difficult trade-off between between finances and and people's livelihoods and conserving a species for the for the future. It, it really is difficult. And to get back to the question, I think there are people that are extremely passionate about it. And there are also people going like, just a minnow. So yeah, I think I think you get the whole spectrum. It all it all depends who you ask. So uh, but I also think that it's one thing not taking it serious and just not taking it serious versus not taking it serious through being unaware and not really having the knowledge of the plight of these fish, realizing that if they go extinct from this river, they this is where they occur. If they're endemic to this catchment and you lose them, they are gone. I think you know if you if you if you have that knowledge, I'm almost wondering how you can not care. But that's just a personal personal feeling. So. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. That was very interesting. And now uh, for the fun part of, and the most, I think part of the excitement is the build up to the uh, spot prize winner. So uh, my colleagues here yeah, have, uh, thank you, Martin. That's much appreciated. Sorry. We will definitely use this information. Um, so, my colleagues here, um, Riza and Jonathan, they've um, helped me with the selection of the lucky prize winner, but we've got two uh, prize winners. Uh, I'm going to first announce the, the first uh, prize winner, which is our spot prize winner. And you can hear the drums uh, going to one, two, three. And that goes to um, Tristan Warren. Uh, well done, Tristan. Um, the prize is uh, a two night stay at either the Swatberg Nature Reserve or the Roshapan Nature Reserve. Um, our learning um, uh, at the learning at Cape Nature awareness, uh, learning at Cape Nature, will be in contact with you um, with regards to informing you uh, about your prize. We will be in contact with you um, and just asking your details to contact you. Um, then um, there's also another interesting development here, um, and I want to thank my colleague Jonathan here for this. Um, and that goes to uh, Joshua Overmeyer. Um, he has been a loyal webinar viewer right from the start, Joshua. Um, so you will be. Uh, we will also be in contact with you with regards to putting your prize together. Um, but thank you very much. Um, and thank you, uh, presenters. Uh, thank you, Edward. Um, thank you, Ernst. Uh, thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Martin. And most of all, uh, thank you, audience. I also want to thank um, Riza Barnard for assisting with IT, Jonathan Jason assisting with the admin, and uh, audience. Uh, let's keep uh, Mother Nature in uh, mind when we do everything. Let's do it responsibly. And uh, let's make sure that we enjoy heritage, uh, both uh, with a nice braai, but also with uh, nature in mind. Uh, I want to thank you once again. And please uh, also, um, I will be sending a feedback survey to you. It's not uh, a must. Uh, it's obli uh, uh, it is uh, optional if you want to answer that. So I will respond to the attendees of the 
uh, webinar today, I will send it to your email. You can respond. That is just so that we can always improve uh, on the webinar server. So thank you very much and have a great evening. Thank you, uh, presenters, and let's enjoy the uh, public holiday tomorrow. Thank you and goodbye.